Hello everyone, and welcome to my end of year video where I'm going to rank every game that I finished this year. I didn't finish any modern games this year, so if that's what you're looking for, then now's your time to step out. And of course, this is all my personal opinion, blah blah blah. At some point during each entry, usually at the beginning, I will also say what platform I played the game on. And with that, let's get it started. The Amazing Spider-Man on Xbox 360 is one of the best looking games on the console, but was one of the most mediocre games I played this year. Boasting a mere 10 to 12 hours of game time, even with all the side content, meant that you barely had time to explore the open world. Not that there was a lot to do aside from a few collectibles and listening to Peter scream in your ear every 10 seconds. Seriously dude, a little quiet contemplation every so often while you're swinging around wouldn't kill you. The combat is a vapid Arkham clone and the enemies got pretty obnoxious toward the end. You're going to be fighting with the overly helpful controls and camera for the majority of the experience and my god, if the camera doesn't give you the rumblies, you should look into being an astronaut. This is the second ever game to make me nauseated, including VR. The camera is close enough to Peter that you could mistake this for a Resident Evil game. The swinging is also stifled and basic, and the soundtrack leaves a lot to be desired aside from the beautiful end credits song, which in fairness is a needle drop anyway. That said, a decent enough plot that felt like the true sequel to the movie we never got, and gameplay that can be really fun in its better moments, left me feeling satisfied by the end. It's not a must play, but if you've played every better Spider-Man game, give this one a shot. But it's merely a C. Atlantis The Lost Empire for the Game Boy Color was easily my biggest surprise this year. People who say there wasn't a good licensed game before Arkham are wrong, damn it. I mean, that was always a notion based on confirmation bias and critics that were unfamiliar with the source material giving needlessly dismal scores, but still. With utterly gorgeous visuals and animations for the hardware it was working with, Atlantis is one of the better NES era platformers I've ever played. I mean, come on, there's a unique animation for each of the characters treading water, and they actually animated water dripping off the characters when they get out. I'm sorry, is this Uncharted? Nah, bitch, this is Atlantis on GBC! Did those graphics come at the cost of nail-biting difficulty due to your low field of view making it harder to dodge enemies and obstacles? Yeah, yeah, this is not an easy game, but it's still far from unfair, so personally I'll take that trade. As you go on, the levels become more sprawling and the journey more arduous, but with a full cast of playable characters that have multiple unique abilities to metroidvania your way through while bumping along to some hot 8-bit beats, even when it got tough in the later stages, I was still having a great time. Will it blow your dang mind? No. But it's an awesome hidden gem for an underappreciated system. This one's a B. Avatar The Last Airbender on Game Boy Advance was not what I expected at all. While this version retained the story of its big brother on consoles, it lost the action RPG stylings of its counterpart, and instead opted to go for a top-down adventure puzzle game. Think along the lines of Link to the Past or Goof Troop would actually be even closer. It managed to pull off the style quite well by constantly throwing new mechanics at you and having a head-scratcher or two along the way. And combine that with pretty visuals and music, and this game was a pleasure to play. I might even like it more than the console version due to a single very important improvement. No more Haru, thank god. No Four Nations though, it's a close call. I only wish the GBA game was longer, as you can complete it in only a few hours. If you didn't enjoy the console version, or hell, even if you did and just want more, I'd recommend grabbing this one. If you pick it up though, I must warn you it has an absolutely brutal boss rush toward the end, which accounted for every death I had in the game. All 40 of them, so good luck with that. This one gets a high B from me, I really enjoyed it. I can't wait to play the other portable Avatar titles. Barbie is the Princess and the Popper on GBA had a lot going for it up front. Four playable characters with their own powers that you can use to solve puzzles and platforming challenges? Yes, boss. Plus, I'm a fan of the source material, so I was excited for this one. But all that went down the toilet more or less immediately. Incredibly easy platforming that hardly ever used the character's individual talents, and barely a puzzle in sight. 
The gameplay devolves into a super tedious collectathon and never goes anywhere from there. If you've played this game for 20 minutes, you've played the entire game, trust me. I don't think I've ever seen less effort put into game design in my life, and all the charming graphics and tunes won't do a thing to change that. After an hour of this game, I was bored to tears, I just wanted it to be over. But no, I had another two hours to slog through. Who made this game then? Probably some fourth string studio that got paid pennies for it, right? No, it was way forward. Yeah, that way forward. Shantae, Sigma Star Saga, A Boy and His Blob. This is an accomplished studio that specializes in making spectacular licensed games for handheld systems. So what happened? Did they just not care this time around? As bad as this game was, the pain of playing it is outstripped entirely by the heartache of watching a legendary studio put out such garbage. I guess that's why this game isn't even on their Wikipedia page. Princess of the Popper gets a D for disappointment and for don't play it. Shame on you, way forward. Oh yeah, here we go, rent time! Batman Vengeance on GBA was miserable to play. The only thing that kept me going was my years of Sith meditation that helped me channel enough hatred and rage to beat this piece of shit. Batman controls like a sack of potatoes. He has almost no chance in melee combat, especially once you get farther into the game. So you better use those batarangs well, because once you run out, you are screwed. The platforming just sucks. You can never tell what the bat can actually stand on or grab, and the enemy placement is often blatantly unfair. From there, it just gets worse with every type of level. The Robin stages are so banal they make you want to go huff whatever Scarecrow's cooking up, and in the Batwing levels, every enemy is a major bullet sponge, and the graphical style makes it way too hard to discern what you can and can't crash into. You're going to be doing these levels over and over again until they're burned into your memory enough that you can finally beat them. That's nothing compared to the Batmobile levels, though. They are capital U unplayable. You're speeding along at about 8 billion miles an hour, but can only see a few feet in front of you, causing you to constantly crash into unavoidable obstacles. And with the extremely tight timer, the only way you're going to see the next level is if you memorize the entire thing. This game is the definition of all style, no substance. If white knuckling and teeth grinding your way from start to finish and letting the rage fuel you sounds like a good time, this is the game for you. But the beautiful graphics and soundtrack aren't nearly beautiful enough to tear your mind away from the torment of the minute to minute gameplay. Easy D. Fuck, man, I don't even want to think about this game. Call of Duty Roads to Victory on PlayStation Portable is the worst World War II FPS I've ever played. Maybe even the worst FPS I've ever played. Your battle isn't against the Third Reich in this game, it's against the frame rate. Literal 5 to 10 frames per second the entire way through, and that's after stopping you with an in level loading screen every two minutes. It's graphically somewhat impressive for the hardware and year of release, but when it comes with performance this bad, what's the point? The hitboxes are also dog shit, and there's no aim assist whatsoever, so have fun using the face buttons for precision aiming. Even on easier difficulties, you'll be dying in just a couple bullets or from grenade spam that you can't get away from because the player character maneuvers like a slug, the Nazis throw like Tom Brady, and cook their grenades down to two second fuses. <sighs> you'll be killed by enemies that constantly ambush you at point blank range and the fastest sensitivity option is too slow to do anything about it. Add to that allies that constantly hard grief you by pushing you out into enemy fire every chance they get. Not to mention there's an escort mission straight out of your worst nightmares. Add to that the most painfully basic level design I've ever seen. Blow up those 88s, flink that half-track, mark those panthers for the artillery! Do the same things you've done in every World War II FPS since the beginning of time. And that's just the first mission! This game has no original ideas. It's a zero-effort, cookie-cutter experience from start to finish. Terrible checkpointing and glitches abound as well. I had to restart the entire final mission because I fell through the level. I legit had to stop myself from chucking my PSP. I can't even believe I had the patience to finish this awful garbage. F. Triple F. F it to hell. Burn it. Get it off my fucking screen. I don't want to look at it. Jesus. Ah, oh, thank god. Finally something good. What is there to say about Castlevania that hasn't been said before? With pitch-perfect design, a killer soundtrack, and great visuals, this is one of the tightest 8-bit experiences that you can have. 
Don't let the overblown level of difficulty scare you off. Anyone can see the credits of this game with just a little patience, united with the willingness to learn and get better. And maybe a bit of holy water cheese. Or wait, firebomb? But it's blue. It has a friggin' cross- ah, oh, whatever. There's hardly a better game out there for providing a fun, fair challenge to the player that leaves you feeling more than satisfied by the end. This is the original Dark Souls. It teaches you over and over again that button mashing won't get you through. It takes calm, methodical, decisive action to beat this game's challenges. As soon as you stop freaking out, you realize, hold on, this isn't actually that hard. I just have to experiment to find out what works, come up with a plan, and execute it properly. The only complaint I can levy against it is the lack of narrative, even within the manual, but that's par for the course for this era. Non-random sickle spawns for death would also be appreciated. I played Castlevania on the GBA release, and not even the lesser visuals of the port could hamper my experience. This is a game that everyone should play at least once, and for that reason alone, I wouldn't be got dead placing Castlevania below an S. Condemned Criminal Origins on 360 was a real treat. Finally, a horror game that's dripping in atmosphere that doesn't need to rely on jump scares to unnerve the player. The sound design is absolutely perfect, the sinister tones of the ambient soundtrack will keep you in a constant state of fight or flight. And it's a good thing, because unlike most horror games, you'll need to be on edge to not get blindsided by the cunning, furtive psychopaths that roam the game's eerie urban jungles. The combat system, which takes a while to get a handle on, combined with these truly dangerous opponents ensure that you never feel like you're fully in control. You're weak, you're alone, and everyone's out to get you. Hope you can keep your nerve. Wait a sec, did that mannequin just move? That's probably just my imagination. The only part of this game that truly falls short is the narrative. Until the very end of the game, you're waiting for the other shoe to drop, and when it does, it's quite the anticlimax. The setup to what could have been a daring psychosociological narrative instead devolves into a juvenile supernatural cop out. While this game won't be joining the pantheon of gripping, narratively driven horror titles anytime soon, what's here is still an excellent overall package, and one well worth playing for horror fans that may have overlooked it. Condemned is an A. Ah oh boy, time to get your pitchforks out. Don't worry, it probably won't be the last time. I truly don't have anything to say about Crash Bandicoot Warped on PS4. It was exactly what I expected. I had fun while I was playing it, but it's just about the most forgettable game I've ever played. There's nothing particularly wrong with it. The gameplay, level design, and music were all serviceable, and it struck a good mix of challenging and fun. I really don't know what to tell you, it just didn't connect with me at all. Maybe I simply don't like these types of games, but I think Crash lacks a certain charm factor, je ne sais quoi, to hook me and make me want to keep playing. I think I first noticed this line of thinking once I finished Warped, and realized I had absolutely no desire to play the other games. Like, it feels harsh to say, but I'm indifferent towards this series. It's not a way I thought I'd feel. I have no nostalgia whatsoever for Crash, this is the first game of his I've played. As such, I'm put in the weird position of trying to like a game that everyone adores, but that I feel nothing for. Outside of that nostalgia factor, I just don't see all that much here to fall in love with. Sorry guys, Crash is a little low B for me. Dark Watch on Xbox was a big disappointment. This game gets heaps of praise nowadays, and frankly I just don't see it. Don't be fooled by my skill that's making the gunplay look decent. The abhorrent aim assist makes for some of, if not the worst game feel of any FPS I've ever played. Take having to continuously fight the game to keep your aim on track, combined with enemies that constantly duck, jump, and AD strafe like this is Counter-Strike, all the while you're trying to line up the headshots that are necessary to kill most foes, and it just made me want to tear my friggin' hair out. The selection of guns and enemy types alike is pretty paltry, and the level design that has an enormous hard-on for enemy spawners and wave defense becomes a chore real quick. The hub world is so pathetically puny that I don't even know why it was included. At least the vampiric powers are fun to use, but there aren't that many of them, and they're really quite poorly balanced, leading to you only using one or two of them regularly. The plot is also about as bog-standard as it gets, with a betrayal you've seen coming since the beginning of the game, and not much else besides. The final boss has a climactic entrance, but immediately turns into a boring bullet sponge that lasts for far too long. By the time I was halfway through, I was ready to be done with this game. If I had to praise something, it looks good, and the cutscenes are quite excellent, even surprising me once or twice with their grisliness. 
The soundtrack goes hard in a lot of places, and it also has multiple endings and two progression trees which provide some much needed replayability. Not that I could ever force myself to play it again. And uh, having a sexy Native American heroine is a nice change of pace? Get out of my head, devs. <sighs> this game is most notable for having a fully nude sex scene in a T-rated game, but that's about as exciting as the experience gets. Darkwatch might ride the line between C and D more than any other game on this list, but after visiting it again to record footage and getting to re-experience the gameplay, there's only one place it could go. I'd still encourage you to give the game a shot if it sounds interesting to you, because this will probably go down as one of my most contentious ratings. Step aside, Darkwatch, this is how you do a Western FPS. Dead Man's Hand on Xbox was a joy to play. The arcadey gameplay combined with a solid score made this a true gunslinger's paradise. Playing poker for your power-ups at the beginning of the level is a nice touch, and the destructible environments powered by the game's ahead-of-its-time physics engine really pushed the Xbox to its limits. You can ragdoll enemies with explosions or headshots, shoot out support structures to drop objects on them, or even shoot their molotovs and throwing knives out of the air before they can get to you. With limited health and accurate enemies, this game can be somewhat difficult, even for an FPS veteran though, so I'd recommend sticking it on easy to have a more laid-back experience. The plot is also a basic revenge affair, but it does well to keep the ball rolling so that you can keep doing what you're here for, slinging lead at cartoon baddies. And it also provides a number of boss fights that play out in different ways, so I can hardly complain. The first, I know. The only significant negative this game has is that there are only nine firearms, and you'll quickly find out that three or four of them make the others look like squirt guns. That's all there really is to say about this title. It's a simple game that's executed extremely well, and if you're looking for a fun western shooter, this should be one of the first things on your list. Dead Man's Hand is a solid B. Eternal Sonata on the 360 was easily the most beautiful game I played this year, and maybe ever. Its radiant art style and fairy tale aesthetic combined with a divine four-disc score from one of the best video game composers in the industry, Motui Sakutaba, make this game a feast for the senses. Seriously, look him up, he probably composed your favorite game. Add to that a unique hybrid turn-based battle system that incorporates light and shadow into your strategy with 12 playable characters to mess around with, and you have one of the better JRPGs of the entire generation. Unfortunately, this game does fall short in a couple areas. The number of enemy types is severely lacking, as you'll often find yourself fighting the same two or three enemies for entire dungeons, which can be quite lengthy. Aside from a few drastic difficulty spikes, the game is also completely without challenge, especially if you use some of the more OP companions. Look at you, Viola. Its deepest failing, however, is the narrative. The story is a roller coaster ride of world building, politics, and philosophy that never really culminates in anything coherent. It has its moments, certainly, but the direction they ultimately took the plot in was mind boggling in the worst way, and you'll find the majority of its large cast of playable characters to be tropey and underdeveloped. It's sad to say that this game had everything going for it, but it's held back from being a true masterpiece by bungling the most critical element of its genre. That said, I hope you enjoy it more than I did, because I still consider this game a must-play. And it was a highlight of the year for me without a doubt. Shit's a straight mood. Get the PS3 version, by the way, it has more content. Eternal Sonata is so, so close to an S. But not quite. Freedom Fighters on Xbox was a really pleasant surprise. Despite that, it's strangely difficult to find things to say about it. Its clean third-person shooter gameplay and satisfyingly simple squad mechanics which encourage exploration, combined with an absolutely brawlic soundtrack from the phenomenal Jesper Kidd, along with a basic yet well-executed plot, makes for an overall pristine package that you don't want to put down until the credits roll. Kinda like the sentence. This is also one of the few games that can output 720p resolution on the Xbox, where it looks... Hell, it looks like it's on 360. I must stress, it's not a game that will blow your mind. It's not going to be on anyone's top 10 of all time list. But everything it attempts to do, it does valiantly. It's just a fun as hell game. I honestly don't have a single complaint with it. This is truly 6th generation comfort food gaming at its best. Freedom Fighters scrapes its way into the A tier for me. How did 
define the way I'm feeling. Eco on PlayStation 3 is a masterpiece, plain and simple. If you've never played it, stop watching this video and go play it immediately. The less you know about it, the better. Just do yourself a favor. This is one of maybe three games that have ever released that I would call perfect. I wouldn't change a single thing about this game. The lack of on-screen prompts, the oppressive, ethereal Escher-esque architecture, the absence of music during most of the game, the wordless character interaction, the minimalist narrative primarily told through gameplay, the intuitive platforming and puzzles, the simple but frantic and hard-to-master combat, Eco is simply flawless. You could spend hours picking this game apart and still not get any closer to what makes it so special, because it's the gestalt of so many little things that come together and hit you like a truck at just the right moments. No other game will tear your heart to shreds with barely a word spoken. It's a game that you feel instead of play. It's a game that you can only truly play once. I hope it connects with you as much as it did for me. Despite the wide popularity of Shadow of the Colossus, Fumito Ueda's other works are, by comparison, forgotten. I urge you to change that, and to give one of the medium's most undervalued auteurs the acclaim that he deserves. Ego could belong nowhere but the S tier. From one masterwork to another, Katawa Shoujo on PC's mere existence is a miracle. The fact that it was ever released is absurd, but then for it to be one of the greatest visual novels of all time is simply mind-blowing. Not every route is flawless, not every character will connect with everyone, but the writing in this game is sublime, and the soundtrack could rival that of any AAA title. The emotional and dramatic yet grounded and painfully real storylines will pull on your heartstrings like few other games can manage. It also provides an excellent jumping off point for those who are unfamiliar with this style of game, in particular with its accessibility options for those who are a bit more squeamish. I cannot recommend this game enough. It's a must play for anyone even remotely interested in one of gaming's most underrated genres, and it's easily one of my favorite games ever. S tier. If somehow you're still not convinced, then go watch the video that Gigag made on it recently. The game is also absolutely free. You have truly no excuse. I played Mech Assault on Xbox all the time as a kid, and while I have a lot of nostalgia for it, it's hard to look at the single player and say that it's not wanting. A runtime of only four hours, missions that don't provide a lot of variety and nothing plot, annoying support crew, and a frustrating lack of checkpoints meant that this game was lackluster at best. Mech Assault's graphics and destruction are impressive for the time. The core gameplay loop is quite refined, and the soundtrack is serviceable, especially DeWolf's tracks but it's clear that the campaign was a tacked-on feature to what was meant to be a nigh-exclusively multiplayer offering. It hurts to be this hard on it, but it gets a C. Mech Assault 2 Lone Wolf on Xbox was also part of my childhood gaming rotation. This game improved a lot on the first entry's shortcomings, but only just. A narrative that was a bit more involved with better production value, a slightly longer duration, and much more mission and mech variety all helped this version feel like a passable sequel. Graphically though it's about the same, which is a bit disappointing. Given more time with the hardware you'd think they could have at least fixed the Silent Hill 2 draw distance. The soundtrack has far more needle drops this time around with appearances from Papa Roach, Korn, as well as DeWolf again, and the music overall was a decent upgrade from the original. That however is where my praise for it comes to an end. While it's undeniably better than the first game, it's not a substantial change by any stretch of the phrase. As it is, I'm sad to say that I can't even raise it a letter grade. Mech Assault 2 is a high C. And that brings us to this video's sponsor. High C is a refreshing- Rent um euer Leben! Er hat ne Panzerfaust! Run for your lives! He has a bazooka! I didn't expect Medal of Honor on PlayStation to be nearly as good as it was. A modern control scheme was a very welcome feature for such an early console first-person shooter, and ensured the game didn't feel dated at all. The graphics and animations are excellent, the sound design and score are fantastic, and the missions provide plenty of diversity in both structure and setting. The only complaint I can levy against this game is the over-reliance on insta-kill bazooka enemies toward the end, but for me it wasn't a serious annoyance. Years later, after spawning countless imitators and creating its own prolific subgenre, the first World War II FPS is still one of the very best. Medal of Honor sits comfortably among the top Bs.
Medal of Honor Vanguard on PlayStation 2, however, is one of the most underwhelming World War II shooters I've ever played. It starts out strong with a few missions on the Italian front, a rare sight indeed for a game of its type, but things only go downhill from there. The game is quite short at only four or so hours, the visuals and performance are poor even for PS2, and it has a damning lack of checkpoints. Despite ripping the gameplay from European Assault, it loses the vast open battlefields and side objectives of its predecessor, making for a very straightforward experience. In spite of its linearity, it still has no interesting set pieces to speak of, and the mission structure is par for the course to a fault. It does at least have a soundtrack worthy of a Medal of Honor title, and boasts a brilliantly constructed anti-sniper section toward the end of the game, but that's the extent of its merits. Vanguard is simply one of the laziest offerings in the MOH catalog, and earns its home in the C tier. I had heard that Mercenaries 2 World in Flames on 360 wasn't as good as the first game. It turns out that was an understatement. It went on to fix nothing about the original and invites its own new bevy of problems to boot. You're still insanely underpowered when in a vehicle, taking vastly more damage than you can dish out to an enemy vehicle of the same type, which exacerbates the musical tanks that you had to do to survive in the first game to unprecedented levels. When I hijack a vehicle, I should feel powerful inside of it, because it's not easy to do, but it's the complete opposite. The only thing you can do once you hijack a tank is look around to find the next one before the tank you're in gets blown up. To add to that, the campaign is quite short. Instead of the GTA-style mission structure of old, a lot of what would have been main story missions have been turned into optional side gigs and challenges. The game also adds a resource gathering element for no apparent reason that completely obliterates the pacing, as you're forced to grind up some fuel if you want to have a chance in a lot of missions, rather than the system of simply buying it that worked perfectly well in the first game. Add to that a host of glitches and universally poor performance, and it's sad to say, but you'll certainly have a better time revisiting the first title rather than playing this rare miss from Pandemic Studios. A real shame, because it is graphically impressive for when it was released. At least the grappling hook was cool, but Mercenaries 2 just can't quite crawl its way out of the D tier. I'm being hard on it, yes, but man, as far as disappointing sequels go, this one is up there for me. Metal Gear on the Nintendo Entertainment System has a completely overblown reputation of being the worst Metal Gear in existence. Some even calling it worse than Survive, a notion that I find absurd. As a port to lesser hardware, it's really admirable. An overall better opening, cards ordered properly in your inventory, gun shooting more than two feet in front of you, walk under cameras, shooting from the box, the silencer being less obscure, far less wall punching, and a straight up better soundtrack are all improvements and additions they didn't need to have but they took the time to make this version stand on its own. Did they have to take out a lot? Sure. The Metal Gear fight is gone, the helicopter was replaced, the jetpackers don't fly around anymore, the super epic parachuting scene is gone, the respawning is far worse, putting you in or before building one no matter your star level, the traps that open up twice as fast with jank hitboxes are just unfair in this version, the fourth wall break is gone, the ending scene is worse, and the coup de grace the inexcusable Building 2 basement slash maze code fiasco. But most of that is, to my understanding, due to hardware limitations. Is it still worse than the original? Yeah, especially because of the updated 2006 translation, but either version that you play, you're gonna have a great time. It would be amazing to see elements from both the original and its port combined into a truly definitive version of the game. After Pigs Fly, of course. Metal Gear is a low B. I don't get Metal Gear Rising or Vengeance on the 360. From the brain-dead plot that undoes or ignores everything in Guns of the Patriots to the downright awful hack-and-slash gameplay and obnoxious soundtrack, I just don't get it. This game is barely five hours long, but let me assure you that was five hours spent in absolute agony. I haven't had less fun playing a video game in years. The camera is so far inside Raiden's ass, endlessly fights you, and moves so damn slow that you can't see a single enemy around you, and get attacked constantly from off-screen with nothing you can do about it. The asinine control scheme means that all you can do is mindlessly button mash your way to victory, occasionally parrying and praying to the god of breakdancing that it decides to actually work. There are optional upgrades that are completely mandatory to progress through the game and offset the utter nonsense that is the combat. All of the boss fights are the same idiotic garbage that have spectacle as their only redeeming feature. The DLC is also a complete joke, just more terrible combat scenarios with hardly any narrative to speak of. 
The soundtrack that's fully composed of needle drops from a genre that I actually enjoy just drones on and on as you redo the same boring, broken sections over and over. This is the only game that competes with Roads to Victory for the worst game I finished this year. This is one of the worst games I've played, period. It's by far the worst Metal Gear game I've played, and it's a stain on a near-platinum series by a developer that at this point seems to make just as many pustulant piles of piss-stained putrescence as they make generation-defining masterpieces. It even managed to annoy me in the 10 minutes I had to play to capture footage for this video. This game is so goddamn bad, it made me quit a world record I was attempting. If that doesn't say it all, I don't know what the hell does. Without a doubt, Metal Gear Rising is F tier. But again, just because I despise this game doesn't mean that you will. I doubt many people will agree with me on this one. Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots on PS3 is a tough game to get a handle on. Truth be told, my own opinion still isn't fully formed on it, despite it being the first game I finished this year, and I doubt it ever will be. While it's easily one of the messiest Metal Gears, it also begs the question, is that the point? Kojima's usually not a man known for subtlety, which I stress is a cultural difference in Japanese media, not a discredit to him as a writer, and by comparison, modern Western media has died at the altar of subtlety to the point where if the characters don't say a word for the entire runtime and just scowl and grunt at each other, it's somehow an ingenious story. But anyway, did he actually pull it off this time? Who's to say? But the thought kept me up at night long after I finished this game. This is either one of the dumbest or one of the smartest games ever written. And knowing Kojima fairly well at this point, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt here. MGS4 has awesome stealth mechanics that it hardly uses, a deep and thematic war economy that's thrown by the wayside, endless callbacks to previous titles that sometimes seem far too cynical, and other times appear genuine and sincere. The plot that can only be described as unhinged and schizophrenic can hardly keep track of itself. It seemingly answers every question we had and treats every one of them like a joke. Where can you draw the line between intent and the death of the author? Where can you derive meaning, and where are you grasping at straws? We'll never have conclusive answers to those questions, and that's what makes MGS4 a special game. The decisive end to a war without end. Only one thing is certain. This is a landmark title with insanely good graphics, deep gameplay, a solid OST, and unique narrative. Whether you end up liking or hating it, you should at least give it a shot. It goes in the A tier. I would have been pissed if I paid full price for Metal Gear Solid VR missions on PS1. Thankfully, I didn't, but that's not to say it wasn't still a huge letdown. It was fun to get to use all of MGS's mechanics in new ways, and it allowed the stellar gameplay of that landmark title to shine through in a way that the base game simply didn't have the length for, even though I'd argue it's one of the only Metal Gears that truly forces utilization of its entire arsenal through airtight level design. Anyway, VR missions succeeds in that it's more Metal Gear Solid but there's really not much else to keep your interest, especially if you don't want to go for first place in every challenge. It could have used more weird missions or some sort of overarching narrative to keep you advancing toward the end goal. There's also very little payoff once you do actually complete the game. A lot more unlocks and secrets would have been appreciated. A big thing that was pushed in the marketing was the ability to play as the cyborg ninja, Grey Fox. Hell, he's even on the cover. But in a move to rival MGS2, what they don't tell you is that you only get to play him in three lousy missions for all of five minutes. That's practically a fuck you moment of the player as far as I'm concerned. Hell, one of the missions is so short that in the time I've been talking about Grey Fox, I could have finished it. Oh wait. At least the soundtrack kicks ass. In fact, that's probably the only thing that in no way disappointed. As many problems as it has, at least you can finally uncover one of the series' greatest mysteries. What color panties does Naomi Hunter wear? What? <laughs> I'm not telling, go play it yourself. <clears throat> For just a moment, hear my plea. Lend me your ear. Allow me to make one thing clear. I urge you not to jeer or sneer. Instead, my dear, sincerely shed a tear for the unendearing, poorly engineered smear that is VR missions. As I fear this year, it will cohere near its peers in the mere nadir, that is to say, the bottom or rear, of the dreary C tier. <sighs> Blear. I much prefer my racing titles to lean more sci-fi than authentic, but I heard great things about Need for Speed the Run for 360, so I wanted to give it a shot. 
In practice though, it's just another realistic racing game with a slightly better setup than most. The run has you racing across the entire contiguous United States from Cali to NYC in a single prolonged contest for driving supremacy. This is a really cool premise that should provide a magnificent variety of dazzling scenery plus shifting traffic and weather conditions. And to be fair, it does sometimes deliver on that promise. However, it doesn't quite live up to its potential. The choice of cars you have over the course of the race is severely limited. You could at one point get more vehicles in the limited edition, which I own, but that functionality seems to have been abandoned when the servers went down. Word to the wise, you're going to need to disconnect from the internet to even play this game. The run also trips over its own gimmick in that you spend a lot of time in some states and then skip over vast swaths of the US entirely, making for a pitiful runtime of only 5 hours. Combine this with an impotent soundtrack and some utterly outrageous rubber banding forcing you to drive near perfect even on the lower difficulties, and you have a game that provides breathtaking moments and controller snapping frustration in equal amounts. Unless you're a big fan of the genre, don't feel like you're missing anything special by skipping this one. It's going straight to the seats here. There's so much potential here though. Triple the length of the game and the number of cars you have access to, make the races a bit more fair, and give me the run too from Miami to Seattle, or hell, a different country altogether and I'd be all over it. Eh, what can you do? Panzer Dragoon's saga on the Saturn is, in a word, legendary, and it's easy to see why. The Saturn's early demise in favor of the Dreamcast led to the game receiving a minuscule print of only 30,000 English copies. On top of that, truly good Saturn emulation was unfathomable until just a few years ago, meaning that if you wanted to play PDS, you'd have to shell out upwards of $1,000 for a physical copy of the game and the hardware to play it on. This combined with the game's exuberant critical reception, some even calling it the greatest JRPG of all time, meant that in the last 15 years this game has achieved mythic status. But does it deserve it? Unequivocally so. This 4-disc epic was a technological marvel, being one of if not the first fully voiced RPG on consoles, and with excellent voice acting besides. It hardly contains its booming primal soundtrack that remains one of the greatest OSTs ever composed to this day. Exquisite 3D graphics and gorgeous open-ended environments push the Saturn to its utmost limits, all with hardly a frame drop in sight. The two and a half hours of FMV cutscenes had a cinematic flair that matched or perhaps even surpassed Kojima's soon-to-be-released tour de force Metal Gear Solid. On top of all that, a unique and refined gameplay loop where every enemy is its own puzzle to be solved that is without a doubt the best JRPG battle system I've ever seen. Not to mention secrets, side quests, and varying playstyles that give the game outstanding replayability. No game can be perfect, though, and where Saga falls a bit short is with a narrative that is still argued over to this day. I can't say I appreciate everything it does with its story, especially toward the end, but if one thing can be said, it's certainly memorable, and it still captured my affection. The exploratory levels also have a glut of interactive elements that are categorically uninteresting, and don't do any of the heavy lifting in the world building department that they should be responsible for. The mostly optional backtracking might lead to a bit of boredom every so often, but it was rare enough to not bother me. The game is also somewhat short for an RPG. A casual playthrough will probably clock 20 hours or less, but none of that time is wasted. You never need to grind levels, and every battle can be beaten with the proper strategy. Its shortcomings aside, even among the giants of the greatest year in video game history, Panzer Dragoon Saga was lightning in a bottle, one of gaming's true magnum opuses. It's not overrated, it's not overhyped, it's simply one of the finest video games ever made, and you owe it to yourself to play it and the rest of its sterling series. As freaking tier. I didn't know anything going into Papo and Yo on the PS3, and that's how I recommend you play it as well. Consider this my endorsement. Please don't let my dumbass ruin it for you. Go and play it. If you paid attention in Spanish class, Papo and Yo's story is spoiled by its own title, and then again in the game's opening scene. I'd honestly even consider advising people to close their eyes for the first 15 seconds of the game. Other than that instance of incredibly poor timing, this game is a masterclass in ludonarrative harmony that provides a fairly explicit allegory for those who are willing to look for it. Even if the game is spoiled for you by its own structure, or if you figure it out ahead of time, the final reveal still hits like a ton of bricks. It's an exemplary marriage of gameplay and narrative that other games should pay close attention to and seek to learn from. The environmental puzzles are simple but engaging, and combined with the calming, impressively long soundtrack, you're lulled into a near-zen state as you carve a path through the familiar favelas. The pacing is positively sublime, giving you just enough time to forget Monster's last transgression before yanking you back to reality once more. 
This game is an ideal length for what it wants to accomplish, and has a straightforward yet affecting narrative. I struggled with where to put Papo and Yo for a while, so don't misconstrue my placing it in the A tier as criticism. In the same vein as Eternal Sonata, I still consider this game a must-play, even if it doesn't quite have the oomph to reach that true masterpiece category. Power Rangers Ninja Storm on GBA is your typical lazy beat-em-up. Barely an hour long with copy-paste enemy types, only a few boss battles, and little to no replay whatsoever aside from seeing a few different boss animations and playing a nightmare level as Hunter and Blake. If you're a fan of the source material like me, have an hour to burn and can play it for free, go on ahead. I still had a lot of fun with it, especially because some of the enemies' attacks had me cry laughing. But it's not worth seeking out on its own merits. Except that is for the soundtrack, which has absolutely no business being as good as it is for such a low effort game. Seriously, one of the better OSTs I've heard in a GBA title. I feel sorry for the composer who clearly finished the soundtrack before seeing the game, or he wouldn't have cared enough to make such a killer backing. The best thing I can say about the gameplay is that at least the Zord fights provide some spectacle and it doesn't do anything terribly offensive. But I've now spent more time on this paragraph than the devs did on the game, so let's move on. Ninja Storm is a low C. Honestly though, check out that soundtrack. Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase on PS1 is a weird game for me to talk about. Due to my extreme familiarity with the source material, seriously, I've probably seen Cyber Chase 20 times, my VHS is nearly burnt out. This is a game that I have a lot of nostalgia for, even though this was the first time I've ever played it. It's like seeing a liminal space in an anime and getting homesick for a place you've never been. Is the game actually worth playing, though? Probably not, for most people. The fact is that it's a cheap imitation of Crash. It retains the difficult but fair gameplay of that series while also lacking any replayability, and being quite short in a mere three hours. A lot of the boss fights are far too similar as well. The game lacks many of the settings found in the actual movie, and the soundtrack is both incredibly short and not very good aside from the odd highlight. Personally, I still enjoyed Cyber Chase. It kind of wraps around into the so bad it's good territory for me, but I can't in good conscience put it above a C. Okay, so let me get this straight. If I don't recover these Dark Souls, then the world's gonna end. Am I right? You got it. Shit. Combine Metroid Prime with Silent Hill, and what do you get? Shadow Man on Dreamcast came out of nowhere to blow my expectations out of the freaking water. This game was doing 3D Metroidvania to absolute perfection before the genre's namesakes were even considering such an ambitious project. You get an extremely vast, macabre labyrinth to get lost in, be terrified of, and eventually grow to learn and conquer. A haunting, intense score by the masterful Tim Haywood enhances the lurid visuals, and an engrossing plot derived from the Shadow Man comics also makes this one of the greatest licensed games of all time. I just can't praise it enough. Shadow Man was derided as a Tomb Raider clone when it was first released, but in fact it's quite the opposite. Tomb Raider wishes it could be anywhere near as good. I don't normally complete games, but I simply couldn't stop until I acquired every Dark Soul and maxed out my Caddo on my near 30 hour journey. And I even managed to uncover the final secret of the game, the Book of Shadows, the contents of which I will not show here. If you want to pick up this game physically, the only way to go is the Dreamcast version, as the Nintendo 64 and PS1 ports are completely inferior for their own reasons. However, you should instead support Night Dive's remaster of the game, as it ironed out the technical shortcomings and added back content that had to be cut for the original release. Let me be clear, this is the most underrated, ahead of its time masterpiece that I have ever played. It's simply action platforming perfection. Shadow Man is the only game that can make this eventually start to sound like... home. Shadow Man climbs its way into the S tier. Speaking of, Silent Hill on PS1 was quite a trip. The game itself, aside from the sewers at least, wasn't all that scary, but combine the eerie visuals with Akira Yamaoka's biting industrial machine core soundtrack and you're in for a rough time. 
The fierce atmosphere of this game is undeniable, and the gameplay creates a judicious balance of empowerment and helplessness. Of every game I played this year, this was certainly the most terrifying. Unfortunately, it's not without its shortcomings. Many of the puzzles focused on misdirection rather than actual difficulty in solving, which is a style I don't find particularly engaging. The plot is also more difficult to unearth than a Souls game, but once you actually do put the pieces together, unlike the games it inspired, there's not much of substance to be found. Those are, however, small complaints in a game that otherwise delivered on its promises, and provided a sturdy foundation that could later be iterated upon to produce the genre's best titles. Silent Hill is going in the lower A tier. Singularity on 360 is a game that's often referred to as a shock-like, as in it's like Bioshock. However, if you go into this game with those lofty expectations, you're going to be thoroughly disappointed. That's not to say there's not a lot to love about this game. It has well-developed FPS gameplay, fun to use superpowers, and a decaying research station that keeps you on your toes. But the problems start with the game's painfully generic and terse action hero man soundtrack. The plot is also nothing mind-blowingly amazing, despite the batshit endings. Is the game bad? Far from it. In fact, I'd recommend a play to FPS fans that enjoy a tinge of horror, but just know going in that the comparisons to the shock games are very much skin deep. Audio logs, upgrades, crappy moral choices, horror vibes, and hand wave immersive sim elements. The gang's all here. Based on the game's release date, it seems like Raven Software saw Bioshock and said, I want to make one of those, but lacked either the talent, ambition, or budget to pull it off properly resulting in one of the more average titles of a studio with fantastic potential that was murdered before its time by Call of Duty. Singularity is still high beat, though. Hey, wanna see my tattoo? Wanna see my tattoo? Your mother must be so proud. Spy Fox is a series of games that I played all the time as a kid, but I had a debilitating condition known only as Peanut Brain, so I never finished any of them. The Secret Agent K9's first adventure, Spy Fox and Dry Serial on PC, was delightful. The visuals are brilliantly animated, the classic point-and-click gameplay keeps the man-child in me happy with lots of environmental secrets to find, and the hilarious dialogue and circumstances the fox finds himself subjected to never failed to bring a smile to my face. This children's game has a more coherent plot than most of the games on this list, and provides a pleasant adventure from start to finish. Can it be completed in a single sitting? Sure, but don't let that stop you from playing this gem of the adventure genre. Just don't forget to bring some trinkets, Mr. Fox. I can't wait to start Humongous' other games. Dry Cereal is a high B. Star Wars Dark Forces on PS1 is a hidden gem not only among Star Wars titles, but early first-person shooters in general. While it's easy to see where its derision as a Doom clone came from in some areas, Dark Forces strikes out on its own to become a shooter classic in its own right. You'll find a large array of armament and equipment to help you complete your lengthy campaign against the Empire, explore surprisingly vast levels without a loading screen in sight, and you'll fight your way through an excess of intimidating enemies from multiple factions. The sound design in this game is immaculate, with decent voice acting by 1995 standards, and the soundtrack is suitably epic, striking an impeccable balance between retaining the musical motifs of the original movie scores, yet standing on its own two feet is a brilliant work unto itself. The plot is… well, it's not KOTOR 2, but it does its job to progress the story forward. Fair warning, the custom PlayStation edition that I played on runs at a custom 15 FPS for the majority of the game. So I'd recommend picking this one up on PC, where it runs beautifully through DOSBox and has mod support to modernize the controls. But even the poor performance couldn't hamper my experience with this awesome shooter. Dark Forces is still one of the best Star Wars games ever made, and deserves its spot among the A's. The upcoming games both use licensed music, so please enjoy these non-copyright sounds. Going in, I was really excited because I'd heard great things about it, but honestly, I wasn't having fun throughout the majority of Star Wars Episode One Jedi Power Battles on Dreamcast. The abysmal controls, trolly level design, dreadfully simple yet overly punishing hack and slash gameplay, and palette swap enemies with unfair abilities, especially their blocking, wore thin really quickly. It turned into a frustrating stress fest before I'd even reached the halfway point. It made me 
me not have fun playing a Star Wars game, something I didn't even know was possible. It managed to piss me off that bad, and it was barely five hours. Does it have its merits? Sure. Five playable characters, plus plenty more in verses. It looks and runs excellent on the Dreamcast, and they were able to snag the film score, plus some of the film's actors like Jake Lloyd and Ahmed Best. It even has a full co-op campaign, which is always a huge plus. I can certainly see someone being nostalgic for this game if they played it on easy with a friend when they were a kid, but otherwise, this game is just terrible. Aside from Battlefront 2 2017, it's the worst Star Wars game I've finished thus far. I was really hoping for a lot more. Low D. As in, loady loady, this game's bad. On the other hand, Star Wars Episode One Racer isn't just good for a Star Wars game, it's one of the best futuristic racing games ever made. The sense of speed is off the charts, the tracks are varied and stunningly beautiful, the roster of characters is completely comprehensive, the game runs at an uncompromising 60fps on Dreamcast and retains the film's score. There's no better feeling in the sci-fi racing genre than spinning through the asteroids of Uvo 4 at 900 kilometers an hour while Duel of the Fates blasts in the background. This game is simply unforgettable, and if you have even a passing interest in Star Wars or sci-fi racing games, this is a must-play. I have only one complaint. There could have been just a few more tracks. While there are a decent number overall, many tracks are remixes of other courses and play relatively the same. Another 6-8 to eight races or even just a mirror mode would do wonders for this game, but what we got is still awesome. A dream come true for Star Wars fans. They don't make them like they used to. Buy this game on Dreamcast where it belongs, not Aspire's crappy substandard port. The same goes for every other so-called re-release that company has shat out. Thank god they're not handling the KOTOR remake anymore. That aside, Episode 1 Racer is a definite A tier. Teen Titans on PS2 is a lot of fun. You can swap on the fly to any of your favorite characters of the team as you kick the Azeroth out of a plethora of the Titans rogues gallery, either by yourself or with up to three friends. While the soundtrack is a pedestrian techno affair that's fully indicative of the time it was made, the clean beat-em-up gameplay with a longer moveset per character than you'd expect helps keep you entertained. If you're not a fan of the source material, then well, first off, get the hell out, but it's not going to hold your attention for too long. I would have to wonder why you're playing a licensed game from a franchise that you're not familiar with in the first place. Unless that game is Shadow Man, of course. The plot of Teen Titans gets hella weird, dog. I'm talking serious fourth wall chicanery. You've been warned. While the campaign's only about four hours, the absurdly enormous cast of multiplayer characters, nigh on every character in the show, gives the game an entire second life as a 3D fighter. Unfortunately, as is to be expected, it runs pretty poorly on the PS2 and despite its mid-2006 release, the game was never ported onto the 360. To make matters worse, the definitive version of the game on the Xbox got a very low print run, making it the system's most coveted holy grail aside from Steel Battalion, which is a special case. So make sure to pick this one up on the GameCube. Teen Titans gets a sound B. Oh dear, looks like it's about that time again. Maybe we should update our laws. Another day, another miss from Platinum Games. The Legend of Korra on PC was a chore to play through. There's a decent title buried here somewhere. The quality of the cutscenes that were newly animated for the game by one of Korra's actual studios are on par with the show itself. And the gameplay loop is really quite decent, allowing you to swap bending styles whenever you please, giving you some very basic control over your loadout through a store manned by everyone's favorite surrogate dad, and retaining the fluid and frenetic yet unyieldingly flawed combat that Platinum is known for. Plus, the Naga levels are a fun and frantic distraction. That difficulty, though. Despite playing on normal, this game is mercilessly punishing, and if you're not locked in, even the basic enemies will beat you like you stole something. Which I guess makes sense, considering Korra never wins a fight in the show anyway. That brutality extended a campaign that can be finished in two and a half hours to a near five hour slog as I beat my head against the later boss fights. The camera certainly doesn't help either, as it fights you almost as hard as your opponents, and the move list for each element is quite short indeed. Well, at least the plot is better than Season 2, which it takes place immediately after. It is worth it to remember that this was originally released as a budget Xbox Live Arcade slash PlayStation Network title, but even with that context, this game is still shoddy at best when compared with its peers. Even if you're a fan of the show, in which case, my apologies for your lack of taste, don't feel like this is a game that you need to play. The fact that it's no longer legally available is of no great loss to anyone. Low D tier.
Do you want to play an entire first person shooter that looks like the music video of Handlebars by Flowbots? Of course you do. 13 on Xbox is one of the best FPS games I've played in a long time. Its buttery game feel combined with a multitude of weapons to choose from, which amazingly all have a time and place where they're effective, a standout comic book art style carried over from its graphic novel origins, varied level design and locales, and all of it brought home by a banger OST that evokes spy thriller with every note, mean that this is a title that every fan of the genre should play. The campaign is also quite long for its type, clocking a solid 10 hours depending on how much you struggle. And that brings us to the game's issues. Extremely sparse checkpoints combined with gameplay that can lean towards trial and error a little too often, especially during the game's many stealth sections, sometimes makes for a frustrating experience. In particular if you're not goaded on the sticks like me. The boss fights can also be pretty challenging. This is a game that'll make you sweat, but no one ever said finding out the truth was easy. Oh, yeah, the plot. Uh, it has intrigue, it has romance, it has twists and turns, it has a cliffhanger ending. Uh, yeah, they were really banking on a sequel with this one, it seems. Oh, well, read the manga, I guess. For me, it gets a well-deserved B tier, and for God's sake, play the original, not that garbage remaster. Thanks to the art style, it still looks fantastic. And now to announce Agro's Game of the Year! Da -da 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 -da. It's Panzer Dragoon Saga. Like, what, what the fuck did you think it would be? Panzer Dragoon Saga is so good that a mediocre story doesn't even matter. It's just... My god, it's incredible. Please play it. And let me just rearrange some things here, and BAM! That is the final ranking of all 39 games that I finished this year. Thank you guys so much for watching. Did you agree with all my rankings? Awesome! Then let me know down in the comments. Did you disagree? Who cares? You're probably an idiot. This took way too much goddamn work and also prevented me from finishing Xenogears and Snake's Revenge, so those will have to be on next year's list. Probably not going to do it next year, so hope y'all had fun, because I sure did. And with that, have a good night, I'll see you guys later, and Happy New Year!